precious cornerstone, sure foundation. You are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe your all to us. Holy Son of God, sent from heaven, hope and mercy. Let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe your all to us. When this passing world is over, we will see. to share this time with you today. My name is Jacob Hawk. I am the new Young Adults Minister here at Preston Crest, and obviously I have not had the opportunity to meet most of you because of COVID-19. Uh, we look forward to being back together very soon, and I'm thankful to have this opportunity for the month of September to share a series with you about one of the best songs that I think we sing in our worship services. Hopefully you've been watching along with our adult education for Bible classes. Mike Pipkin has done an excellent job the past several months going through the life of Paul. And hopefully you will feel like this series blesses your life as well. The story is told about a very rural West Texas town that was celebrating its 100th anniversary of being a small town in West Texas and a reporter from the big city went out to West Texas to try to interview some of the residents as the town celebrated its centennial anniversary. And he ran across an older man one morning in a small cafe for breakfast. And this older gentleman had lived in this small town his entire life, and he himself was 90 years old. And so the reporter thought to himself, you know, this is the type of person I need to interview to tell me about the history of this town. 
And so he sat down at the old man's table where he was having breakfast. And he said, I understand that, that you've lived here your entire life. Is that correct? The old man said, yes, that, that's right. And the reporter said, and, and you're 90 years old? The old man said, that's also right. And so the reporter felt like, okay, this is the perfect man that I need for this interview. And so he said, okay, well, if you've lived here your entire life and you're 90 years old, I guess that means that you've seen a lot of changes take place around here in the last 90 years. And the man said, yes, I have. And I've been against every one of them. Do you know people like that, people who are just so against change? They hate it when the paradigm shifts. They despise it when it disrupts their schedule, their routine. They would prefer that things always stayed the same. Well, as we live life, we quickly learn that with the exception of God's Word, and with the exception of God Himself and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, change is just a part of life. Things don't stay the same. We have to learn how to be flexible. We have to learn how to adapt when things change around us. And one of the big changes that we often see within the church is the type of songs that we sing. I've heard over the years, as I'm sure that you have as well, that some people, they just don't like the new songs. They just want to keep singing the old songs, the old hymns that they grew up with. Now, don't get me wrong, I love old hymns, and I love the older songs that have been sung for decades and decades and decades. But we often forget that even those older songs that kind of serve as the fabric of the tapestry of our heritage. Songs like Amazing Grace and How Great Thou Art. At one time, they were new songs. But someone wrote them and people said, man, that's good and we need to learn how to sing those songs. And so those new songs became older songs as well. And so we constantly live in a time where we hear new songs or we see new songs. And one of my favorite things about Preston Crest is that we sing new songs. And John Scott Davis, as you well know, does a fabulous job leading us in worship as we sing those new songs. But some people, they just don't like change. And you often hear them say, let's stay away from the new songs. They're shallow. Uh, they're hard to sing. They've often been called the 7-Eleven songs. People say there's only seven words and we repeat them 11 times. Let's stay away from those seven 11 songs. I guess for some of those songs, that's a fair assessment. They can be shallow at times and certainly lack the old poetry or theological significance of some of our older hymns. But there's one song that I know we sing here at Preston Crest and it's a fairly new song within the last couple of years. And it's the song, All to Us. No one can say that this new song is theologically shallow. No one can say it's just a 7-Eleven song. And hopefully no one would ever say that this is a song that we don't need to sing. If you look at the words of this song, it is the gospel through and through. In verse 1, as we begin the song, we sing about Jesus and we sing these words, Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus, because you are all to us. And then in the second verse, we pick up with the gospel message again, and we sing these words, Only Son of God, sent from heaven, hope and mercy at the cross. You are everything 
You're the promise. Once again, Jesus, you are all to us. It's a beautiful song. In fact, I've heard some people say that maybe in the next 20 years, this song becomes the national anthem of the church, kind of like our God, He is Alive, has been in years past. If you've heard it sung in a live audience, you know the power that it brings. And so what I want to do in this four-week series, we're going to do this, and then in October and November, we're going to have another study that many classes here at Preston Crest are going to be studying called Coddling the Christian Mind. But here for the month of September, September, we're going to take four weeks, and we're going to look at what we sing in the chorus of this song. I just read you the words from verse 1 and verse 2, but in my opinion, when we get to the chorus of the song, that's where it picks up even more energy, because in the chorus, we make four very bold proclamations about our faith. And each week in this series, we're going to look at one of those four statements. And here is the first statement of the chorus that we sing together as a church family. Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Think about the power of that statement. I love how we sing that glorifying God needs to be the passion of the church. We do not sing, may the glory of your name be the work of the church, or the mindset of the church, or even the work of the church. We sing to God and we say, let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. You know, what we are most passionate about in life is where we spend the most of our energy. It's where we give the most of our time. If you don't believe that, then just look at your daily schedule. Where you spend the most of your time, more than likely, is what you are most passionate about. So we are promising in this song that we will spend the majority of our energy that we will give the abundance of our time to glorifying God. Because as the church, that is our passion. It's a beautiful statement. But that statement begs the question, well, how do we do that? If glorifying God is going to be our passion, then what does that look like on a daily basis. And this morning, I want to give you five ways that I'm calling the five W's that I think show us how to glorify God. These five W's are certainly not an exhaustive list, but I do believe that they give us a pretty good foundation for what it means to glorify God in our lives, what it means to glorify God as the church. And here's the first W of the five W's when it comes to glorifying God. First of all, we are going to do it through our will. And specifically, we are going to do it through our will to say no. Because here's the truth. We will never live like people of heaven if we constantly say yes to what the world wants for our lives. When Paul was writing to the young preacher Titus in Titus chapter 2, Paul said something very interesting about the grace of God in verses 11 and 12. Paul says that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness, and to worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives 
in this present age. You see, that is a description of grace that much of the religious world doesn't often mention. Grace is kindness, and grace is mercy, and grace is forgiveness, and patience, and unmerited favor. All of these things are biblical definitions of grace. But the Bible often describes grace as a teacher. And specifically, in Titus chapter 2, Paul says that grace teaches us to say no. Grace draws the line in the sand. And grace teaches us to turn away from things that are ungodly, from things that are worldly, and to be self-controlled, to be upright, and to live a godly life. Many people gather at church buildings on Sundays and they come into worship and they praise God for His grace. They praise God for His forgiveness. And then they leave that worship gathering and they live a very uncontrolled, ungodly life. And Paul says, when you do that, you are making a mockery of the grace of God. You are diluting its power. You are turning it into cheap grace. And we cannot glorify God if we do not have the will to say no to the very things that are ungodly. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul phrased it in this way. He said, avoid every kind of evil. Now, if there's ever an instance where someone paints with a broad paintbrush, it's 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Paul just says, avoid it. Avoid every kind of evil. And as you well know, there are a lot of things that would fall into the category of evil. It might be gambling. It might be greed. It could be alcohol. It could be power. It could be pride. It could be a shady business deal. It could be going, be going behind the the walls to climb in the company in an unethical way. And Paul says that the child of God needs to avoid such behavior. Paul does not say, be cautious. Paul does not say, be careful. Paul does not even say, use moderation. Paul says, avoid it. Avoid every resemblance of evil in your life. Have the self-control and the willpower to turn away and to walk the other direction. Church, we are in the glorifying God business. And we cannot glorify God if we don't have the will to say no to the very things that could lead us far, far away from who He wants us to be. Secondly, if we want to glorify God, it's going to come from wisdom. But this is not our wisdom. This is God's wisdom. This is seeking His guidance, asking for His discernment when it comes time to make very difficult decisions in life. James, the brother of Jesus, wrote in James chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. One of the best ways that we glorify God is by asking for his guidance. One of the best ways to steal the glory from God, is to think that we can do it all on our own. There have been times in my life when I have gone to mentors of mine to ask them for their advice, to ask them for some wisdom. And they often tell me the same thing when I come to them and say, I wanted your advice on this. They will say, you know, I feel honored that you would think of me. I feel appreciative that, that you would want my counsel on this particular issue. 
Well, don't you think that God, our Father, who is the all-knowing God with the perfect advice, that He would appreciate us asking Him how to handle things before we actually do it? One of my favorite stories is about a, a preacher who was on the phone one night at home and his wife and children were in the living room and he got off the phone and went into the living room and told his wife, he said, okay, here's the deal. I just got a phone call from another church across town and they're offering me this new position. It's going to pay me better money and better opportunity for us. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go back to the bedroom and pray about this. I want you to go up in the attic and start getting the boxes and start packing us. Well, that's, that's not exactly how it works. If you're going to ask for God's wisdom, you've got to wait for God to respond before you just go ahead and act. But we glorify God when we seek His counsel, when we seek His wisdom. Because God says, when you ask for it, I'm going to give it to you. I know that you need it. And I love that James reminds us in James 1.5 that God's going to give us that wisdom generously without finding fault. God could say, no, you've asked for wisdom before, you didn't listen, and you blew it, so the wisdom well is run dry. That's not what God does. James, the brother of Jesus, tells us anytime you ask for the wisdom of God, God's going to deliver. And He's going to deliver generously. Every prayer that seeks God's wisdom is a glory to His name. When you're struggling trying to figure out how to raise a teenager and you ask God for help, you know what you're doing? You're glorifying God. When you ask God to help you be a better husband, when you ask God to help you be a better wife, you know what you're doing? You're glorifying God. As a church, when we ask God to help us grow our congregation God's way, not our way, you know what we're doing? We are glorifying God. Because anytime we seek His throne for His wisdom, it is a glory to His name. Here's the third W on the list of five ways to glorify God, and that is through our worship. One psalmist described worship this way in Psalm 115, verse 1. He said, Not to us, O Lord, not, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and your faithfulness. The Apostle John, in the great book of Revelation, when he describes the heavenly worship, at the throne of God. John says in Revelation 4, 10 through 11, that these angelic, heavenly, celestial creatures, they lay their crowns before the throne, and they say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. And so the worship of the church today, though we are on the physical earth, should not be less than at the very least the attitude of the worship that takes place in heaven. In fact, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that one of the reasons that God saved us was to declare His praises. Worship is a time where we tell God, you saved me, so I am going to glorify you. I am going to sing to you and to tell you from the bottom of my heart how wonderful and majestic and vital you are to the well-being of my life. So if that's what real worship is all about, and it's directly tied to our glorification of God. It begs the question, why would we think that half-hearted, rote, methodical worship 
is pleasing to our Father. Now, it's been difficult with the coronavirus among us that we can't assemble together. And there are times when you go through life and you show up on a Sunday morning and you don't have it in you to worship that day because you've had a terrible week. There's been a crisis in your family. You have questions about God. And so you may not physically from the outside look like you are on fire from God, but God knows our heart. And our heart can only express itself appropriately through a heart that wants to worship the Almighty Creator and to say time and time again, Father, You are wonderful. You are mighty. And I am so thankful for what You have done in my life. The fourth W that I want to mention on how we glorify God is in our wonder for God. And this kind of goes hand in hand with sincere worship. But if we truly want to glorify God, we have to have this attitude about God that He is so amazing, that He is so awesome, that He is so wonderful beyond our comprehension. The psalmist said in Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, that the heavens, even the heavens, declare the glory of God. Why is it that the heavens can't get enough of God? But we as human beings, we sometimes think that we can figure everything out about God through our own personal study and expertise when it comes to studying the Scriptures. Now, don't get me wrong. Peter tells us in 2 Peter that we've received everything we need for this life through our knowledge of Him. But just because we have everything that we need about God in Scripture, that does not mean that we'll ever understand everything about God. He is too wonderful for our comprehension. And we cannot ever think that we can book, chapter, and verse ourselves into a complete understanding of the Almighty. He is so much greater than we are. So much more perfect. So much more wise. So much more loving and compassionate and generous that all we can do is stand back and stand in awe and say, you are too wonderful for our comprehension. In the past, I have sat in church leadership meetings where we dream about what God could do at a certain congregation. And then that dream is often put on hold or even worse, erased. Because people begin to say things like, well, how are we going to pay for it? Or we can't pull that off here. Or that's just more than we can handle. We are biting off way too much than we can chew. But we often forget that we serve a God, according to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. We serve a God who is able to do immeasurably more than we can either ask for more than we can imagine. If we put a box around God, if we limit God to our church budgets or to our attendance reports or to what's happened in the past rather than what can happen right now, then I don't think we're glorifying God the way that God truly wants to be glorified. But here's the last W of the five W's. Yes, we glorify God through our will to say no and through our prayers for wisdom. We glorify God through sincere worship and through our wonder for who He is. But one of the most important ways that we glorify God is through our witness to the world. In fact, do you remember what Jesus' final words were to His disciples at the end of each gospel account? Jesus said, I want you, disciples, I want you to go and I want you to make more disciples. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus tells His chosen apostles. He specifically uses the word witness. He says, I want you to be my witnesses to all of the world. You're going to start right here in Judea. 
and then you're going to spread to Samaria, and then you're going to go to the utter ends of the earth. And history shows us that the apostles, they did that. They served as powerful witnesses for the Lord Jesus. Throughout history, we have called the final words of the gospel accounts the Great Commission. And that's what it is. King Jesus commissions His servants. He gives them an order. But we have often turned the Great Commission into the Great Suggestion. Jesus is not suggesting here that we go and make more disciples. Jesus is commanding us to go and make more disciples. Disciples. This is not an option. This is an order. And if we're truly going to glorify God, the mission, evangelism, has to be a critical part of who we are. What do you think will happen one day on the day of judgment if you live your entire life without leading a single person to Christ or at least trying to lead someone to Christ, knowing that Jesus ordered you to do that before He left this earth? I don't know about you, but that's not a conversation with God that I want to have. God calls us to be His witnesses. And we can't glorify God if we don't ever walk up to the stand and testify. Yes, glorifying God is a serious responsibility. And we do it in many ways. But if we leave any of these five things undone, we can't do it the way that God wants us to do it. For example, if we have the will to say no, that first W there, but we never ask for God's wisdom in our life, are we truly glorifying God? Well, I don't think so. And, and then what if we do ask for wisdom, but our wonder for God is lacking? Is that glorifying God? No, I think that's just someone who prays because they don't know what else to do. What if? What if we have sincere worship? We, we come on Sundays and we're on fire to sing and we're on fire to praise God, but we don't witness to the people around us. We don't try to lead others to Christ. Is that glorifying God? You can't just glorify God on Sunday. It matters what you do every single day. And then what if we are that great witness? What if, what if we constantly want to tell others about Jesus, but we aren't that tied into a local church? We don't make it a priority to gather with the saints, and we don't want to worship with other believers. Is that glorifying God? Well, I think that's missing a big piece of the puzzle as well. It takes all five things. We need the will to say no. We need the wisdom from God. We need sincere worship. We need wonder for our Creator. And we need to be strong witnesses to the world around us. And when we don't do all five things, the glory of God is not our passion. And when the glory of God is not our passion in the church, we get ourselves into a lot of trouble. If the glory of God is just our goal, well, we end up arguing about a lot of things that at the end of the day really don't matter. When the glory of God is just a punchline, well, then we often let a few negative voices control the direction of an entire church. When the glory of God is just a dream, well, eventually we stop trying. 
but when the glory of God is the passion of the church, then we truly become the church that God wants us to be. And so we sing, and so we believe. Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. May God bless you.